Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Um, we're uh, a webinar, a webcast, an online show, um, whatever you want to call us. <laughs> you can call us anything. Uh, we are here live on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. Central Time. Uh, however, if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. We do record all of our shows every week, so you can always go to our website, which I'll show you at the end of today's show, and go there and see all of our archived recordings. We have our um, recordings, any presentations that people include, we put there, uh, links to websites that are mentioned, all of that is available to you um, after the show. Um, we do a mixture of things here on Encompass Live, presentations, interviews, mini training sessions, uh, book review sessions, um, basically anything library related, that's our criteria. If, you are, if it's library related, we'll have it on the show. Um, we have, uh, sometimes we have Nebraska Library Commission staff do presentations. Sometimes we bring in guest speakers, and that's what we've done this morning. Um, our topic for today is, as you can see from your slides there, meeting the unique needs of teens. Um, and on the line with us is Rochelle McPhillips, who is the adult and young adult librarian at the Columbus, Nebraska Public Library. Hi, Rochelle. Good morning. Good morning. Um, just north, a few hours north here of, of Lincoln. Um, yeah. About an hour and a half. About an hour and a half, yeah. Takes, Depending yes. on how you drive, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, takes me a little less. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if you know where you're going, and yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a session that actually um, was done at our uh, Nebraska Library Association and the Nebraska School Librarians Association last fall. Um, and I saw it on the um, the program there and thought it was a very, uh, very timely topic, good topic, kind of things that people are um, having issues with or having their own, uh, trying to figure out how to deal with their, the teens in their libraries. So I invited Michelle to come on the show. So she's here to share with us what they did at their library. So I'll just hand over to you to take it away. All right. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone who uh, signed in to listen this morning. I hope that you um, have some good things to take away from this um, and feel empowered and have some new tools uh, to pull out and use in your library. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of background here. I started at Columbus Public Library in April of 2009. There was not an established program for young adults in this library. No recurring crafts or book clubs. Um, we did have a nice collection. We had no space for them to visit, uh, just to kind of sit and visit with each other. And we are just two blocks away from our public middle school that has about 800 students enrolled. So um, Columbus is also uh, we have more manufacturing uh, factories here uh, per capita than I think anywhere in Nebraska. I, I don't quote me on that, but I think I'm right. Um, so we have a lot of people who do shift work and can't flex out of their day to pick their children up from school. So those after school hours for our town, it, they're really um, crucial for us to get those kids engaged in some place where uh, there are eyes on them. So that happens to be, because we're within such close walking distance, oftentimes the library. And when this started, we knew that we had a lot of, when I started here, we knew that we had a lot of uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers visiting every day. And uh, we just hadn't quite addressed the number that were coming over. And staff did not feel empowered or, or equipped to handle a large influx of any age group at that time of day. And before we started addressing these things in earnest, what we'd really done was one staff member would look at the other and say, oh, these kids. And the other one would say, I know, right? And that was the extent. So we had to do something. So I came up with an action plan. And the first part of that plan was to look at what we already had in place. What tools did we have at our disposal? And the first one of those was our behavior and conduct policy. It was sound. It outlined most behaviors that we could predict and gave us some wiggle room for those behaviors that we couldn't predict. Um, it gave us some leeway. Uh, I think the word 
uh, discretion, library staff discretion is in that policy. Um, that policy is available on our website and I do give you a link to that at the end of the presentation. If you need a policy, I think it's a sound one, a good place to start. And don't reinvent the wheel. You can copy. Um, we also needed to look at our unattended child policy. Was the age we had set the right age? And our policy says you have to be 11 or older to be in the library without another responsible party. And for us, that, that means another 11-year-old. So if you're 9, you can be here with your 11-year-old brother as long as he's keeping track of you. And we decided that was a good age for our community. Any younger than that was too young for us to be comfortable. And if we made it older, we'd be excluding some some students who needed to walk over here to wait for rides after school. Um, that's also available on our website and we keep copies of that policy in English and in Spanish to hand out to patrons who um, aren't aware of it. So once we looked at our policies and decided, okay, we have some place, some ground to stand on, we needed to talk about our library space. What was our jurisdiction? particularly outside of the building. And we have um, public sidewalk on two sides of our building. And then we also have some grassy area. And then we have a walkway from the sidewalk to the front door. And we had a lot of people hanging out outside after school. And we needed to know, could we go outside and say, hey, you have to be quiet or you have to leave? And how far did that extend? And what we found was, of course, our lawn, that little walkway from the uh, door to the sidewalk, that was all ours. But we decided that the public sidewalk that wasn't really our jurisdiction, we'd pretend. And as long as the patron will pretend with us, um, we can enforce our rules that far outside of our building. Um, and of course, and we'll talk about this in more detail later, uh, if they don't want to follow directions from staff in either of those areas, then we have other steps to take, including calling the police. So we defined that. And then we needed to talk to our community. We were getting a lot of complaints. Um, the director was getting weekly complaints from people about the um, just chaotic atmosphere, the tense feeling when they visited the library after school. We um, talked to parents by sending home a letter to them, letting them know that, hey, it's great if your child wants to hang out at the library after school, but here are some things that we need you to know um, so that you're not surprised if we have to enforce some consequences for behavior. Um, so it was welcoming and also informative. And over the years since we started this, um, the language has softened quite a bit in the informative part of the letter. We also needed to talk to a neighboring organization who was seeing some behaviors outside of their building after school as well, and they were um, upset because it was perceived this was our problem. This was the library's problem. And if you are a young adult services person in your library, you know that this was then uh, my problem because I was the young adult librarian. So we needed to talk to everyone who, was, who had some stake in this. So we talked to middle school administration, the after school program, that neighbor, we talked to city hall, we talked to the police, we got everybody involved, had everybody meeting, talking about the different um, opportunities for, for young people to be engaged after school. And once we had those things, then we knew that if if we were having behavior from a patron in the library, we could reach out to them and to their parents and say, you know, this doesn't seem to be working, but we're aware of these other opportunities that you could take advantage of that really helped us under have a better understanding of what else was going on during the after school time in our community. And doing this, everyone knew we were working on this. This is a top priority for us. I was quoted in the newspaper several times, um, not always exactly correctly, um, and, but people were aware that, hey, we're on top of this. 
so once we had done those things, I, and as we were doing those things, I was also trying to engage the patrons here in the library by putting on crafts, um, and there was no program budget for me to work with, so I was, I was really, um, like somebody donated some yarn, and that was my lifesaver the first year. Um, our friends group gave me some money so I could purchase board games to keep them uh, doing something after school. The UNL Extension Office is a wonderful resource for us, and their nutrition program will come over every so often and do a program with us on healthy snacks. I also did two book clubs, one here at the library, and then more importantly, one at the school. I thought it was important for them to see me as an authority figure in their school. You know, when I visit, it's sort of puts me on the side of the teachers because I have access to the teachers and I can walk around the building on my own and um, I think that changed a perception for them. Plus they were excited to see me at school because it was novel and uh, it's just fun to see somebody at school that's out of, out of your routine during the day. And then they could say, hey, I know you. And then when we saw each other again, we had a better rapport. We are starting to build a relationship. And then this is the big one. Um, staff was really at a loss here, and, and because this seems like my problem to fix, um, we felt like, I, I felt, and I think they did too, that we were often on opposite sides of this. Um, you know, Rochelle was the bleeding heart that loves every middle school child that ever walks through the door, and they can do no wrong. There was a perception of that. And, we needed to work through that and, and try to overcome that, and we did that through continuing ed and some staff training and also just talking about our procedures. This is such a big point that it gets its own slides here. So for our staff support, I used an article called Inside the Teen Brain, and I do cite this at the end of my presentation, so you'll be able to look it up as well. What was important about this article for me is it talked about uh, human brain development, and it talked about it in a way that doesn't excuse behavior, but it gives us a reason, and it gives us a better understanding. You know, um, a sixth grader stands at the top of our stairs at the beginning of sixth grade, and he looks at our banister. And as he's thinking, that looks slighty, he's sliding. It happens instantly because he's lacking a filter. It's biological, folks. It, it's true. So as he's sliding and thinking, well, you, this is slighty, it, it's all happening at once. You know, in seventh grade, he pauses just for a moment. And he might still slide in seventh grade, but he's thought about it for a second and he's maybe even made eye contact with me, so um, he's checking in. But by eighth grade, he's not stopping anymore. He's not still sliding down the banister. And of course, there are exceptions to this rule, but this, ch this child actually exists. He's now um, graduated high school, actually. <laughs> but, but this happened, and I've seen this happen over and over again between the sixth grade and the eighth grade year. And what's wonderful about this article is that when other staff would come to me and say, oh, they just have raging hormones, I could say, oh, no, no, it's their brains. <laughs> They're still growing. They're still myelinating. And I could point to this, and somehow that helps us understand and be a little more compassionate when we make it about growing up and about biological changes in their brain. It softens it a little bit for us. I also introduced staff and did a refresher for those who were already aware of the 40 developmental assets. This, um, take a look at those and see how what we do plays an important part in our community, how we're another positive adult in this child's life, how we are building connections that can last a lifetime, how we're offering um, entertainment and education and information that they wouldn't necessarily get anywhere else, and that we have a unique role in that um, because we're public libraries and because we subscribe and embrace the Bill of Rights for library users. We also um, brought in someone else I had seen speak at a conference, and I liked her presentation, and I liked her background in dealing with, um, she worked with kids who were 
removed from their homes. So she was working with some kids who were pretty tough and some pretty tough situations. So it was good for me to bring someone else in so I wasn't the lone um, bleeding heart so that they could see that this, this wasn't just me saying, hey, come on, get on board, that, this, that there were other people who felt this way as well. And then we needed to reframe the situation so staff could relate to some of the some of the behaviors that we could change on our end that would make our lives easier in the long run. Um, <laughs> so those are both planning the workday and offering our patrons some options. And I framed these things for them like this. At 3.30 to 3.40 in the afternoon, we see we found out at one point that we were seeing 60 to 90 middle school and high school age children every day who were coming in without a caregiver or an older sibling or a parent. And so when you say 60 to 90 people of any age group, that's overwhelming. And we were still trying to take breaks. We were still trying to call our overdue list. We still thought we were going to cross things off our to-do list at 3.40 in the afternoon. That, to me, was the equivalent of Burger King thinking, you know what, it's about 10 minutes to noon. Why don't we take the fryers apart and really scrub them clean? I mean, it just didn't make any sense. This is our rush. This is our busy, busy time of day. We need all hands on deck, everybody dealing with customers, everybody helping the people who are the reason we are here. So if your break isn't taken by 3.30, you're not going to get your break today. And if you haven't done that today, guess what? Don't worry about it until tomorrow. So you're off the hook. And then we needed to change the way we were having conversations with patrons. And we were hearing a lot, I hate going to the library after school. This time of day is the worst time of day to visit. And we were commiserating with them. We were, yeah, we know, it's busy, it's really chaotic, there's a lot of people here, it's noisy. We needed to change that script. We needed to change our response so that it was positive rather than wallowing. And we all did it, myself included. Um, so I thought of it this way. You will very rarely find me at a grocery store on a Saturday morning because there's, I, I can think of a million other places I would rather be, um, some of them even unpleasant. I can't stand going to the grocery store when it is that busy, when people are taking up the whole lane, when um, someone's stopped in the middle of the aisle to dig in her 50-pound purse for that one 10-cent coupon for something. I just can't stand it. And if I were to go to the manager and say, I hate coming here on Saturday mornings, you should do something about this. There's not, if there's not anything he's going to do about this. These are his customers. These are his patrons. That's why they're there. So what he would be smart to do instead is to offer me alternatives. Did you know you can order your groceries online? We'll have them ready for you when you get here if that's a service they offer. Um, we deliver groceries, so if there's something you need, call us, let us know. Or he could say, you know, Tuesday evenings are the quietest here. If you want to get in and out of here without hassle, if you can rearrange stuff so you can come on Tuesday nights, that's ideal. That's him finding ways to solve the problem I'm presenting him with. We needed to do the same for our patrons. So instead of just saying, oh, I know, it's so busy in here right now, we could say, you know, if you call me a day ahead of, if you call us a day ahead of time, we'll get your books ready. You can pop in and pop right back out. We'll have them at the desk for you. Or we could say, um, you know, the best kept secret in town is that we're open at 10 o'clock on Saturday mornings. So don't go to your grocery shopping then. Go to the library then because that's when we're not busy. So those are the things we needed to change. As we needed to change our culture and our attitudes in order to make that more positive for everyone involved. And that's just good customer service. And then if you are approaching this problem and you are setting out to solve it, you definitely need to keep some things in mind. Um, you know, we had 
we talked about already, um, it was my problem to solve because I was the young adult librarian. Um, so here are the things you really want to avoid. More rules that are specific to an age group. We had a policy be, and procedure be proposed to us that outlined some very specific behaviors, outlined very specific consequences, and the language that was used um, gave it away that this was really aimed at one age group. And, and that to me wasn't comfortable because had I seen what I thought of as horseplay between two adults, I was not going to want to approach it the same way that policy was um, suggesting I approach it for a couple of 12 year olds because that situation is potentially more dangerous for me and we needed to level that out. We needed that to be something we could enforce across the board from youngest to oldest and um, and that's in the and we say that we abide by the Library Bill of Rights. So that's in there. That is in line with that. And then we needed to, to be careful that it wasn't me versus them or me and my supervisor or me and whoever else had um, come around and like decided that okay, we can solve this, that it didn't look like us versus them. And that was that was tough, um, and then we needed to make sure that if a young adult patron returns a book and it's wet or it's damaged or they lose a book, that that doesn't come back to me to solve. That's a circulation function. That's not something I do. I buy the books, I put on the programs, um, and I help advocate for them when we develop policy. That, those are my major functions as a young adult librarian, and it didn't need to be me calling them and saying, hey, you turned that book back in and it was wet. That's not my function. And this is why, because these are my kids, and no one's allowed to tell my daughter I use this picture because it's several years old. Um, but this is Tyson, Sierra, and Declan, and they're fan fantastic kids, and um, I'm very proud of them. But when staff would come to me and say, hey, one of your kids made a mess with paper towels in the bathroom. I wanted to say, well, who dropped them off? Because you know they were supposed to go home with their dad. Um, but that was that was how it was being brought to me. One of your kids just uh, went screaming out the door. One of your kids slid down the banister. And what I needed to do was change that perception. Because, guess who wasn't my kid? Every child on earth between the ages of 11 and 19. I needed to divorce myself from the idea that they all belong to me. Um, which wasn't really hard to do, actually. Um, but I needed to help other people uh, to get away from that thinking. They are all our patrons. And there were times during this process when things were really difficult, because this took a long time, um, that I cried at my desk. I just thought, how am I ever going to stay here and fix this? It's impossible. It's too big. Um, but what got me through, and what I hope if you get nothing else out of this today, and even if you get this next point, that maybe you can share it with someone else who will get it next. Um, chant this to yourself. A patron is a patron is a patron is a patron is a patron. I could not say that enough. I had to do this for everyone involved, for staff, for myself, for the people I advocate for, and for all of our library visitors. And in doing to do this, it's it's simple. Stop saying my teens. Stop saying my patrons. Don't use that pronoun. Stop owning them all on your own. They're our patrons. They're our teens. They're our visitors. They're our customers. Start using that language. Um, so then when I was turning this around and not using the term my teens. Now if you and I meet and we're both young adult librarians and we're talking about the things that we do uh, in our libraries, I'm going to say, yeah, my teens loved this. That's okay. But if you're dealing with this and you're seeing that division, nix that language. You can't use it anymore. It is on your no list. 
Um, also, as part of our um, continuing ed for our staff, we I put together some things that were working for a couple of us. My supervisor was really a big cheerleader for me at the time and we were both trying different things to see what would work when we were trying to uh, address behavior issues in the library. And the things that worked are the things that we took to staff and said, hey, this is what we'd like to see everyone doing. So we asked them, when patrons start coming in, smile, greet them, get out from behind the desk, kind of get in where they are. If they're all around this table and it's near the magazine rack, that's the time to dust the magazine rack and to make sure everything's in order. Um, so just, just be where they are and sort of don't let that um, sort of energy build around them. Get in there right away and help diffuse it. Ask them if they need help. They're customers, so say, you know, we have a program today or uh, a new cart of books just came up today, guys, or say, did you know that we have board games? You guys could all be playing Monopoly or Risk right now. And then I also noticed that they tended to be just a little bit quieter, even if it was only a notch, <laughs> just a little quieter if they were seated. So we would ask them to sit. So after they've been here for about 10 minutes or so, if they're still standing and still kind of pacing around, we do ask them to find a chair. Or we did. This is before we had a teen space. Now we do things a little differently. But this will work in most libraries, I think. And then if there were eight patrons around a table that was designed for four, We'd say, hey, could four of you move over there? You guys choose who moves, but when I come back, I need to see fewer people at this table. And then if behaviors were just not settling down, if we were seeing some specific things or we had asked them to, hey, you know, we need to split up, we needed to get very clear. And I call this one and done. One verbal warning, and then you follow through if you don't see improvement. So we want them to ask the patron if they need help. If the patron says no, um, you could say, all right, that's great. We see that it's too noisy over here and it can't continue to be this noisy. If it stays this loud, I'm going to ask you to leave for the day. I give one warning, so I won't be back over here to warn you and remind you again. Do you understand? You'll be leaving. And then they say yes and I walk away. And then if they continue to be loud, I don't give them an evil eye, I don't point at them, I don't holler at them from across the room. I get up, I go over and I say, you had your warning, it's not quieter, I'm asking you to leave for the day. And then I walk them to the door. But I don't say, hey, what did I say? Hey, I warned you. So, let's go back a second. Yep. Um, so what we were seeing, Krista, can you still hear me? Because I'm getting a pop-up that says I have problems here. Um, yes, I can hear you just fine. Okay, yep. perfect. Are you doing okay? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are you hearing me okay? Get rid of that. Yeah. yeah Sometimes it it says it it recognizes there may be some sort of a a lull, something with the trend, with the broadband or something, or with your okay. connection, and gives you a little warning. But no, you haven't. You've done. You've come through. Very clearly, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, well, I'll continue, and then we'll yeah. have questions in just a moment. Yeah. So, sure. Um, I did just want to um, mention one thing that um, this is one of those cases where sometimes I wish we did have um, webcams set up for <laughs> when I'm presenting these, doing these remote speakers, because I was really in I'm sitting here nodding for all of that <laughs> stuff you're saying about um, treating the kids like they are. Actually, they are their, your patrons as well, just yes. as valid a patron as anyone else. And I'm nodding, going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yes, <laughs> yes. And I just kind of wish there was cameras here. That they <laughs> so we can see everyone see nodding. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. All right. Well, let's, let's, go, ahead. let's go ahead and keep going. Yep. Um, so this was really important for us, too, because what we were noticing is that um, – so there were four people who worked a desk near our computer lab. And two of us said, okay, we're going to go ahead and we're going to try this one warning and you're gone. Uh, we're going to do the one and done and we're going to see how it goes. We saw considerable improvement on our days and we were not seeing any improvement on the days that other people were at the desk. And we sort of put them, you know, 
in a, in a bad spot by not cluing them in, but we wanted some solid evidence that it was working and what was the difference between the two of us. And let me tell you what was happening before we did the one and done and give you a story about it so that I can sell you on this um, because it feels mean at first. I'm going to tell you it's not. I have proof. So the other two staff members, what we saw, and, and more than just these two were doing it, um, but um, just in this one area of the library, we would see um, behaviors in the computer lab, and then the person at the desk would say, hey, guys, and usually they're still seated, and they're pointing, guys, it needs to get quieter over there. It needs to get quieter over there or else. And then they'd go back to their work, and things would get noisy again, and you'd hear them say, hey, what did I say? I told you guys, if you didn't get quiet, you were going to go. And then a little while later, this is the third time I'm telling you. And then the next time, I have told you so many times you need to be quiet. So by this time, the staff member has Dis the staff member and the visiting patron who has the behavior has disrupted everyone's library use that day. It's made it unpleasant for everyone in that area. The staff member is frustrated, the staff member is then angry, and the patron who has the behavior knows it. So what I noticed is that one day I went over, um, we had a patron at the time uh, who had no volume control, and you you know these folks. They just are always kind of at 11. It's always their, their outside voice, um, even when they're whispering. I don't know how it works, but they do this. So I walked over, and, and he had two people standing next to him watching him play RuneScape. This is how long ago this was. Um, and he, they were being noisy, and I walked over, and I said, hey, guys, it's way too loud over here. It needs to get quieter, or I'm going to ask you to leave for the day. I give one warning. That's it. So if it doesn't stop, you're going to go. Do you understand? And they said, yeah, 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 we understand. As I walked away, he told his friends, see, she's the nice one. She gives a warning. I was almost just floored by that because that's all the other staff, that's all those other two were doing was just the warning over and over again. So that told me a couple of things. One, that they just didn't listen. Once you didn't follow through, you were noise. You were an authority. You were just noise. And also, you were a liar. Don't lie to your patrons, especially why would you lie to that 12-year-old? There's just no need. So if there isn't an or else, let the behavior continue. Just let it keep happening if you're not going to follow through on it. It's so important. It built trust for them. I was the nice one for only giving them one warning. So it does work. It feels mean at first because you're going to have to kick some people out. You're going to have to do it in order for them to know that this is, we mean business. Um, but then they come back and you start over. And I say that when I walk them to the door, I say, you come back tomorrow, it's a new day. We're going to try again. And so we needed to go back to that culture, changing our script. I know we had a few more things to, to hammer out because these were the most common things that we would hear aside from, you know, the things we already talked about. So we had a limited number of computers and someone would come in and say, oh, these kids, they're just playing games, they're just on Facebook, they're not doing anything serious, why aren't they studying, they should be reading a book, they should be doing something productive with their lives, I need a computer. <laughs> well, we could commiserate, we could say, yeah, they should be doing something more productive with their young minds. Or we could say, you know, the computers um, have a reservation system. We can make a reservation for you. If, it, if it's 20 minutes, you could run an errand, come back, and get on the computer. It'd be all yours. Or we could say, you know, it is really busy this time of day, but if you come back at about 6.37, so quiet, you'll be able to get a lot done. We could also say, hey, come in on Saturday mornings. Nobody knows we're open at 10 o'clock yet. Those are all options we could give them, and it preserved the dignity of, of all of the library users. We weren't judging one user's use over another. That was really important. And because 
we would do that for that patron who was complaining if someone thought what he was doing wasn't as important or um, crucial as whatever they needed to do. We talked already about I don't use the library after school anymore. I also wanted staff to get an idea of if that's a safety issue or if it's just an annoyance factor. And in some cases it was a safety issue and we realized that some patrons who maybe had mobility issues or who were entering the library on their own felt intimidated by walking through a large group of teenagers to get into the building. So that helped us like, oh, we really need to crack down on what's happening outside. We need to pay a lot of attention to our front door. And that's considerably better. And then the big one. Um, one day I had a, a man come in on a Friday and I was working by the computer lab and he needed directions or something. And Fridays tend to be a really boisterous, energetic time because we're closed uh, at five. So everybody's in and they're hurrying and the energy is really bouncy and crackling. And um, so he came in and he looked around and he said, wow, this is like a daycare. And I said, you know, you are in the most happening place to be in Columbus right now. Welcome to our party. And then he laughed. It changed the entire interaction for him. We were both smiling and laughing about it. We were kind of having to yell over the noise, <laughs> but, but we had a positive interaction. He left feeling good. I didn't have to diminish anyone who was visiting. Um, and I was feeling good because I felt like I had handled it successfully and in a positive way. So just wherever you can turn that you know, turn that ship around a little bit and see if you can get that attitude to change. Um, you might convince yourself too in the process. So then, um, you know, staff was not an e not every staff member was an easy sell on my ideas on how to deal with our large number of patrons after school. Um, so I had a lot of what I call it at, at my own home, yeah buts. Yeah, okay, that's great, but. So I heard this, yeah, but what do we do when patrons are loud in the computer lab or at the tables? Those are the, the steps we talked about. Ask if they need help. Offer them a service. Um, and then let them know, hey, it's too loud over here. If that doesn't stop, I'm going to be back and I'm going to ask you to leave for the day. So if you don't want to leave for the day, you might decide if you want to sit over here with all eight of you. You might want to split up. Do that in the computer lab if they were sitting around the tables throughout the library. Um, when they're loud outside, it still applies. Um, and if they're loud on the sidewalk and they say, you can't tell me what to do here, I'm on the sidewalk, uh, that's, a, that's a phone call to the police then because that's um, just being a nuisance. And then if patrons are being physical in the building, I'm, I'm pretty um, strict about horse play and, you know, one seat per seat, that sort of thing, that physical uh, interaction, we try to keep to a minimum here. Um, a little bit of, you know, like shoulder bumping and that sort of thing when they first see each other, that jostling kind of turn the other way. Um, but if it's, if it's horse play, if it's legitimate, um, that can turn in a second and become serious and somebody's upset because that really hurt. Um, so we just get we just say, no, um, hands to yourself. And I joke with them that it either falls under um, being violent or a public display of affection. So just keep your hands to yourself here at the library. Um, when they're bouncing or running and playing hide and seek, um, at this time we didn't really have a, a nice big teen space. So it was pretty much, that's a safety issue. Um, worn, but if they're being like a serious threat to someone's safety because the, the building where they're doing it is really full of people. Um, just tell them they got to go for the day. They know better. Um, and then if they're destroying or defacing property, I've told staff just call the police. Um, that's a crime. If, if you catch them and they're tagging or they're tearing up books or um, doing anything like that, you can just call the police. That's criminal behavior. So. And we, we should do that if we walked up to an adult who was carving something in the table, 
or if we saw an adult tagging something or tearing a book apart, how safe we feel approaching that adult and saying, um, you need to stop doing that and I'm asking you to leave for the day. Uh, we might not feel safe. So that's a situation where we probably call the non-emergency number and say, hey, we've got somebody over here who we need addressed. Um, so keep that in mind. How would I handle this if this was a 40-year-old person um, or 30-year-old person or 20-year-old person um, and behave accordingly? Okay, so we're about to get to the really fun stuff, all the pictures of my program. So um, does anybody have any questions at this point about anything we've talked about so far or anything I haven't covered? Uh, yeah, um, so far nobody has typed anything. Um, if anybody does have any questions, use your questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. Just click in there and you can type in your question. I'm uh, monitoring it here. Um, so do that at any time and we'll grab them. Um, I did have one question about the staff that you, um, you talked about dealing with your staff. And I started writing down myself a note to say that um, you said that you helped bring them along, but you know how difficult was that and you actually just kind of got into that, but um, I wonder if, I, just, I get very curious about people who come in, either come into the library or your staff and seem to think that these, these teens were, are um, potentially a nuisance or I can't believe they're acting this way or what do I do about them. Are, do sure. you think it has to do with some of these people have, do not have experience with kids? Like they do not have their, never had their own, so they don't know. I mean, if you've raised your own children, you should, kind of know what they're going to do and how to deal with them. Right. Is and that I potentially think, something? So I can't imagine I think, someone who has been a parent not knowing what, you know. We have to take into account, too, sometimes it's not having had experience with teens. Sometimes it's just having a wholly different life experience where you were able to pick your kids up after school and you took them home or your mm. kids were within walking distance and could let them in or um, you know sometimes it's just a really different uh, home situation true you know, there's yeah. a there's a socioeconomic issue there as well especially here um, and and you know sometimes there were we have a large Hispanic a Hispanic population here, um, and sometimes those comments were racially charged. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. not so much from staff, but so we really had to. The, the, a lot of that was delicate, and we really had to. Yeah. Had and to there's going to be various. I see, there's going to be various reasons why each person, different people, are going to have different reasons. You've got to kind of feel it out and decide what is the appropriate way of addressing this particular person's concerns. Right. At least and, to, you know, yeah. it depends, too, if your staff has, you know, if this is their retirement job and mm. they come from a different background. You know, we had some people come in from different careers where they had more authority over the young people that they served. We don't have that authority. We are not the school. Mm -hmm. You know, so their, right. their philosophy was just different. Yeah. Um, and And... You know, we're a public library, so we have to approach that a little differently. And one of the things, you know, when we talked about, um, you know, people asking, don't you feel like this is a daycare? One of the other things I use for that when people would ask me was to just smile at them and say, I can't imagine where else they'd be. Or I don't know where else they'd go. And when mm -hmm. I can give them that picture, where would you displace 60 to 90 uh, middle school and high school students after school. Where else are they going to yeah. go? We, yeah, is there is there something else? Is there a a teen center that's separate from the library or an area that no. they have for this in your town? And some towns do, which you may say they may have come from places that do have that, and some don't. Yeah. And sometimes I'd let them know. You know, I've heard some of the stories these kids tell. They they can go home, but they don't want to. You know, when mm -hmm. I can paint a different picture of of a reality for them without saying anything overly specific or giving anything away, mm -hmm. um, that helps soften sometimes. Right. And I think that addresses actually, somebody did type in a question that I think that may address uh, talking about, this question is, they get um, adult, com adult customers <laughs> complaining about the teens being disruptive and it should be a quiet place to study in the library. Um, and how do you address this issue with the complainer to get them to understand that teens are allowed here as well? 
And that's my kind of thing what you just did say. But they also added, especially what if they, they indicate the adult that they can't come at a different time when you suggest, well, here's a different time you can come, you can do this. I mean, have you had to deal with that kind of a situation right. where they say, well, you know, Sunday, what did you say, Saturday mornings, weekends, we're, right. I can't come in at 10 a.m.? Yeah, well, we offer study rooms that they can book. So we say, you know, we oh, have study cool. rooms; they're okay. free. Mm -hmm. um, you could use you, you could use one of our study rooms for that. But unfortunately, at the time, we didn't have a computer that they could take with them if they mm -hmm. if that's what they were here for. Mm -hmm. um, but if they wanted a quiet reading space, we offer meeting rooms. Um, so and yeah, yeah so you got to think about options and what you can do to yeah right. give them a place right. to go. Yeah, definitely. And then another question came in, um, what about kids who are being disruptive but are actually waiting for their parents to come and pick them up? I mean... <laughs> well, we offer a couple of options there. We do have a phone where they can call mom or dad if they need to. But mm -hmm. if we have decided you cannot be here anymore today and you are waiting for a ride, mm -hmm. there are two places. Call mom and dad and let them know you'll be waiting across the street at the police station. Ooh. Or call mom and dad and let them know that you'll be at the town square that's just a block away. Okay, so you just have to give them somewhere else safe to go to, go. have an option. Yeah, go. you can't just say, okay, fine, you're allowed to stay here. Because I think it goes back to what you're saying about how you have to follow up. There have to be the actual consequences so they don't think that you're a liar, that nothing's ever going to happen. Right. And right. so, and you know, yeah. we've had parents call and say, "You kicked my kid out, and he's, you know, I had this happen. You removed my 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 child from a program and said they had to sit outside, and um, he's on medication. He can't be in the heat. Well, oh. he's got to behave when he's here. Yeah, that's part of the condition of being in this place. And I had no way of knowing that, and I would yeah. never put them in danger knowingly. But we just have to walk through that with the parent afterward and let them right. know that we are serious. This mm -hmm. this is a place they have to behave. And um, they have to just explain the situation exactly what happened, so they know. Well, we yes. didn't just do this, in you know, with no reason behind it. There was yeah. And, we and having that it. whole policy of how you deal with it and that it's all there, that you can also not just tell the kids this is what's going to happen, you get one warning, that their parents also understand here is how we deal with it. If you'd like it, here's our policy in writing. You can take that and study it with your child and let them know, okay, well. Mm -hmm. And we also have that unattended child policy to fall back on. We have decided ah, yes. this. You're 11. You can be here by yourself, but you have to be able to maintain library appropriate behavior during that time. So we can go back to that and say, you know, you've let your kid come here by himself. You're expecting him to behave a certain way. Mm -hmm. We expect everyone to behave a certain way, and we would ask anyone who was doing that to leave, adults right. included. So when we can say that we treat, you know, that we address that behavior similarly across the board, it helps. Mm -hmm. I like that. Well, I think part of your just way of explaining it to the other staff was, what would you do if this was an adult acting the same way? Right. And you've got, you know, it's treat them all the same, and yeah, then it all, yeah. All right, that's all we have for questions right now. I'll let you go ahead and continue on with the rest of your presentation. Okay. So I said that I started in um, in April of 2009. Um, in May, well, of a April of 2010. Um, this was my office, the picture you're seeing here, um, right in front where that glass is, is where my desk was. And I moved in next door with a very tolerant coworker. Uh, my friend's group, or our friend's group, gave me uh, money so I could purchase some decorations and some bean bags for this space. Um, and we created this little teen space, this little nook. Um, now, I've already said that we had 60 to 90 patrons visiting every day after school in this age group. Um, when we created this space, we had not stood at the door and counted. Okay, so um, just so you know, <laughs> I want to clarify that. Because we created this space because it was the path of least resistance. I wanted a space to say, hey guys, you need your own space. You deserve a place to sit. And when I, when I did that, I, I just wanted a nod at it. Um, we're trying. And we found out quickly that this was not enough space when school started then in August of 2010. And that's when things really ramped up and got serious. We need to address this after school issue. Um, we had some people who were really concerned about it and get really vocal. Um, so that's when we stood at the door and counted um, over 60 every day. And there was a couple of days it was over 90, which is just like, I never would have guessed it was that high. I just knew there was 
there were a lot. So. So that was our first one. We realized it wasn't working. We needed to find something different. We tried the avenue, more paths of least resistance, unused space, meeting space that we thought we might be able to convert. Um, but these things had problems like no Wi-Fi, no cell phone access, that they were blind, that I would be the only staff person in the area, that it would give us one more area that always needed staffed. And someone suggested, what about the nonfiction room on the second floor? It doesn't circulate that much. It needs to be weeded. We need to bring those materials down with the rest of the nonfiction because it was split between two floors. And at the time, I thought, oh, everyone here hates me already, and they're going to give me one half of the second floor. Like, why don't we just paint a bullseye on my head? So I was really nervous to say yes to this, and I never thought in a million years that anybody would really give it to me. So I called our system administrator, uh, Jessica Chamberlain, and I called Sally Snyder at the commission, and I said, would the two of you visit? Walk through the building, talk us through this. Let us tell you the pros and cons. We see you, tell us what you see. Um, they were really helpful in giving their feedback, and I remember very clearly Jessica um, saying, uh, this is where it needs to be. And that was like permission for me to embrace the idea that they would give me half, you know, like one quarter of the building uh, blew me away. Um, so people got busy. The reference librarian, who at the time was also my supervisor, uh, weeded heavily, moved the nonfiction collection, got um, uh, an art print collection that we have moved and distributed around the building. Uh, we had a an art club that had a, what was uh, basically a meeting room dedicated to uh, displays for their club. We relocated them to a spot that makes way more sense and gives them a lot more visibility and created another pr a room that I now use for programming. And then I talked to the young adults who were visiting the library and said, hey guys, what do you want in your teen space? Um, and then if you do go through this process, um, you want to take before pictures because I didn't. <laughs> so there's no, there are no existing pictures of what this space looked like before. Um, and then we talked to uh, our foundation who was willing to give me some money to buy some furniture and some paint for the space. The teens picked um, in the bottom left hand corner, you see the rug. We picked they picked that, they liked that the best, and then everything else for the space was sort of inspired by that rug. So in, um, actually this was open in August of 2011, but uh, this was our ribbon cutting day, so this is when I took pictures. You see we have a nice lounge area. This is visible from the landing of the second floor. Um, it's a huge space. You can see in this picture just how big it is and why I thought there's no way anybody would give this to me. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's what it looked like when we started. And you can see the lounges in the front there and then we have fiction and nonfiction and then our graphic novel collection in the third section. So some more of the furniture. And then in April 2000. 13, we rearranged this space. Um, you could see the lounge from the landing of the second floor, and that was fantastic. It drew people in and was really bright and colorful. But what I had noticed is that the uh, patrons who kind of hung out in that lounge area would heckle the kids who were walking by to go get books. And I didn't want readers to have to run that gauntlet in order to get what they wanted at the library, so we flip-flopped those two sections so that the books that were most circulating were closest to the door. We'd already done our work of advertising our space, so we could do that. So um, there was some outcry. What about the splatter painted walls? We, you can't leave those. So in this picture, this is um, right before we painted, um, I said we can splatter paint some more walls. And so we did and they had a blast. Um, this is what it looked like last summer. Uh, it was starting to look really finished with new book displays, slat wall uh, and uh, displays for our shelves. And you can see the lounge area there is um, now in the middle. 
and in the summertime, if you've ever heard me talk about Anytime activities, I think that was my last Encompass Live session I did was um, passive programs. Um, we put our Anytime activities in that lounge area throughout the summer. And then, um, this is what it looked like yesterday. So. This last school year, I went to an art teacher and she had an outreach uh, class that they were supposed to create some community art projects. I went and talked to them about the teen space and about the library service and told them a little bit of our history, how we got here. They painted these amazing canvases for me um, and for everyone to enjoy in the teen space and that just made everything feel cohesive and done and the best part is until um, two years from now when we take these down to uh, have a new art class paint the other side of the canvases for us. Um, I don't have to get on a ladder and decorate up there anymore. So that's pretty exciting because that's terrible. Um, this is a shot from the other side. We noticed that after school with so many visitors, these tables here will just get piled up with binders and jackets and book bags. So I covered them before the first day of school, wrote some questions on there. I leave crayons out after school. They can draw and color on there. Um, and then the little pop-up tents there say no binders or backpacks backpacks please um, and these crates on the side are where we ask them if you're gonna walk away from your stuff leave it here so that it's not in everyone's way so that's something new we're trying and we're gonna add some coat hooks above that you can see in this picture too that we have eight computers for them to use. We went ahead and just put the Roblox uh, software on them so it's already uh, installed for them. And then back toward the middle of the room, I don't know if you can really see it, it's on the left hand side of the picture, we have a table where we tether iPads. Right now I have three iPads in my department so that gives them some opportunity to uh, use technology here in the building and play games. And then also this summer, as of June, we ordered a custom desk for this space. Uh, we had been using a tall counter up until then, just some repurposed furniture. And it was too tall for so many of our patrons you know, to get their books up and over. Like some of them just couldn't even see over it. It was way too tall. I liked the idea of a standing desk for health purposes, but it was just really impractical for this space. Um, and they love the desk. In the summertime, I can leave my sign-in sheet for summer reading programs right there on that counter. They sign in and then they come and uh, enjoy the program in the rest of the team space. So that is where we are today with that. Um, also, we have somewhere in these years we decided uh, that we needed someone. Well, I do, sure. we do have a question that's I think related to your space there that you have sure. set up. Um, now I just want to clarify because I wasn't exactly sure. You said that this space that you were given upstairs was the um, Nonfiction section, you said. Some nonfiction. Some, okay. It so is this actually? Well, well like, is this space actually like a whole separate room, or is there like part of this that we're not seeing? Is the rest of the regular library? How does yeah, that? Let me scooch back up. Yeah. Because um, the question here is about how they have this. They have a space where the the young adult books are actually shelved in an area where there's computers and tables, but adults are in the library using them also during the day. I mean, that just happens to be the place where the YA books are. And how do they make it so that it's the the teen only? Like she said, the idea maybe to sure. make it a teen only zone after school. Got it. And Got you know, it. yeah. How do you? I'm gonna flip back to this. If you can see, like right there above the computers, I borrowed some language from the Kearney Public Library's teen space. Okay. Um, the yellow sign says that um, when school is in session, or when school is not in session, these computers are for young adults between the ages of, I think it says 11 to 17. That's mm -hmm. what we say, or sixth through 12th grade. Um, so during the day, when they're in school. I'll have adults that come up and use this space. They meet up here. Um, I know there's some adult tutoring that happens in the space. Hmm. That's completely fine. After school, when there's no, when there are teens in the space, 
um, if staff sees adults hanging out, we're all to go up and say, hey, can we get you a study room? Um, would you like to move downstairs to the reference section? Um, we offer them options, but then we say, this is really reserved for the teens after school. You're welcome to browse and get what you need, but um, if you need to park for a little while, we'd like to give you a, a meeting room. And you might want to because it's going to get a little rowdy in here if you, <laughs> if you stick around. Absolutely. Yeah. And make, like hired... earlier, make it a positive kind of thing. Uh, uh, interaction. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. You know, because sometimes they're going to talk about stuff you don't want to hear, and it's just probably better if, if uh, we avoid that. So, um, so we have we do that, and then we have someone who's hired. At first, this was a middle school teacher we hired to come walk around after school. The advantages of a middle school teacher being your um, afternoon monitor is that they know everyone's name. Yeah. <laughs> Right. That's really positive. And the kids um, may already know them as well. Absolutely, and see them as an authority figure. Mm -hmm. And then I don't have to be the bad guy who says, I'm kicking you out, but will you come do summer reading with me next year? <laughs> yeah. um, so, and now that's evolved into, um, it's a para from the school. She walks around every day. She gets here just a few minutes before they do. She straightens up the teen space. She um, addresses adults that are in the space and says, you know, it's going to get really noisy in here. Can we... Can we uh, offer you a different space? Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of clear them out first. Um, and she's so, so sweet. She's the nicest bouncer, I think, <laughs> anywhere in the world. <laughs> so, Description, uh, yes. This is the bouncer for the library, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so she takes care of that sort of preemptively before they get here. Um, and then in the summertime, when the kids aren't in school anymore, then I have I get out there in the morning and I – say, hey guys, the kids are out of school now. They're and then, be oh, here. we didn't yeah. know. Yeah. And then they leave. They're fine with so it. So it sounds like exactly what this person suggested is what you guys are doing there is you have certain times when it is designated teen only and you make sure the adults know it so that they realize what's going to start, what's going to be happening there. Right. And this is a good example for places. I know some places are able to have a separate room with a door that is specifically just for the teens and, and that's all it's for and everyone it makes it very easy. But if you don't have that case, yeah available to you this is exactly yeah um, and then we have another question that's related to this but kind of going the other way what about the teens that are hanging out in the adult areas in this case you said this is up on the second floor correct your new teen space um, yes this is on the second floor and we do allow the teens to use the computers in the main we call it a main computer lab mm -hmm. we have a main computer lab and then the computers in the teen space they're allowed anywhere in the building mm -hmm. okay this live um, person says their teen space is actually in their basement and not all of the teens make it down there like they come in and they just find they don't really they don't know or they don't make it um, they haven't had any major behavior problems yet they're just wondering about them missing out on the teen programs and materials and like do the are the kids is it just a matter of I guess educating them, making sure they know that's where... Yeah, you just yeah. you let them know that that's, that's the place. You let them know that, hey, on Wednesdays we have snacks down here. Yeah. And if they choose not to participate, it's okay. We do what the space you're looking at right now is where we do a lot of our craft programs in the mm -hmm. summer. And while we're doing craft programs, there are kids playing Minecraft and Roblox on those um, computers. Um, they're not participating in the program but the other kids are participating, and that's okay. We let both of those things happen at the same time. Mm -hmm. We sometimes have to address noise there. Mm -hmm. But um, but no, there are some, some of our after-school visitors have been instructed by mom, wait downstairs so you can see me. Right. Our parking situation is terrible. We yeah. have parking. So um, parents don't want to have to try to find a spot. Mm -hmm. So they really want their children to be watching. And um, so... And then sometimes they, we say, you can use the teen space computers, guys. Why don't you go up there? My mom doesn't want me to because she doesn't want to go upstairs when she gets here. And so we say, okay, All you right. can be down here. That's fine. Yep. So okay. it's just like we let children go in all areas of the library, but we wouldn't necessarily let two or, you know, one or two adults who arrived without children to sort of linger in those spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, we, would, we would probably address that in the children's. Did you need some help? We'd like to find you, you know, help you find what you need, and then um, there are great places for you to sit downstairs. Guide them to and the right, the appropriate mm -hmm. section, and yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Think of it that way. Um, kind of equate it that way. But if they don't want to participate, they don't want to participate. They've been in a desk all day. They've been participating at school all day, and now they just want to unwind and be who they are. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Yep. It's okay. doesn't mean you're not cool. You're still really, really cool. <laughs> all right. <laughs> 
<laughs> cool. I think that answers um, both those questions. Go ahead. Awesome. So then something we do that, you know, we talk about a patron as a patron as a patron, but we also want to meet people where they are. And uh, we want to equip our young adult visitors when they get here at the beginning of the school year. And a lot of them, we saw a lot of sixth graders this year. We're seeing a lot of new faces. Um, so our after school mon or our afternoon monitor stands at the front door with these little cutouts. I put six of them on, a, on one sheet of paper so they're not very big. And these are the rules of the teen space. What they can do, what they shouldn't do, and what we absolutely will not tolerate. And I tell staff, if you need, if you feel like this is terrible behavior and I don't want to give a warning, if it falls under this last half, definitely, I'm okay with that. Um, so I, I don't think anybody's going to argue with you if you see somebody get punched. You don't have to say, don't punch again, or I'm going <laughs> to ask you to leave. No, you can just ask them to leave. Um, so we hand this to them, and then as we interact with them for the next um, couple of weeks after the start of school, uh, we'll say, so did you get one of those at the beginning when you got here the first day after school? Can you tell me one thing you read on there? We'll just kind of quiz them a little bit when they're in the teen space, um, just so we know that they know that we're aware um, they've been given rules. Um, and then the other thing you can do with these, I leave these at desks because sometimes we have we have staff who are a little timid to approach behaviors, especially when the behavior isn't necessarily violent, but maybe um, there are a couple of teens who are getting a little a little cozy. I like to take this and slide this little handout in front of them, and then I just whisper to them, ah, read from the bottom up, please. And then I walk away, I come back a couple minutes later, and usually they're grinning and blushing a little bit, and their seats are a little farther apart. So I don't have to address it in a way that really overly embarrasses them in front of everyone. It's just kind of quiet, hey, you need to move away a little bit. So um, it's handy to have these rules. We used to have them posted in the teen space. It's just another sign. We really need to be up on our feet enforcing these things. So, um, And we just added the bullying of any kind to the bottom of this list last year um, because sometimes we had some issues with uh, Facebook. And if we could see that it was happening, uh, we could address it then and say that's bullying and we don't allow that. We're not going to let you do that on our computer and, and tailor our interaction that way. So yes, a patron is a patron is a patron is a patron, but also we meet them where they are. So we hand the rules to the middle school students who come in at the beginning of the school year. Um, just like we do homebound service for people who have that special need. You know, we kind of we tailor our service to who they are and that's okay as long as it's not discriminatory. And this is done in a respectful way. So. And then um, these resources are available to you inside the Teen Brain. I can't say enough good things about that article. It's really um, something I lean on heavily. Uh, and if you're in the thick of it with this, it's going to be a big, oh, okay, okay, I know what I'm dealing with now. Um, and then our policies, please uh, use and copy those as you need. Um, and then my contact information is there as well. And that's what I've got. Okay, great. Thank you. I'd be happy to take more questions if you yeah. have them. If anybody has, we are about um, 10 minutes over our official time, but that's okay, as yeah, I've told people sorry. before. No, that's okay. We go as long as it takes here um, to get through everything. If anybody has any last minute ur minute urgent questions you want to ask right now, get it in there. Um, otherwise, there's her contact info. You can always, I'm mm -hmm. sure, reach out to her later and ask her for more clarification or help with doing things at your library. Um, we do have a, a comment. Um, Sally Snyder, who you mentioned earlier, is actually watching in another room and says, uh, wonderful presentation, Rochelle. Thank you. Hi, Sally. Um, <laughs> and also some more thank yous coming through as well. Um, so I just Excellent. let everyone know. Um, uh, these links will be available, as I said, afterwards um, when we do our recordings. I'll put up those as well so you have quick links to them. So don't try and scribble down like that long URL or anything. We'll get you quick links to that. And I think I didn't mention, ask you, Rochelle, can you um, either send me this PowerPoint or uh, send me a link where you post it somewhere and we'll link to that as well for people? Yes, I will email it to you when we get done here. Okay, great. Yep. So when the recording's up, you guys will have access to these slides too if you want to um, back, go back and refer to them again. 
Um, it doesn't look like anybody has any urgent questions coming through. Just lots of very thank yous. Thank yous. Uh, excellent presentation. Very helpful. Um, Great. Thank so you. I, I am available for hand holding and commiserating and, and <laughs> yes. um, <laughs> because this what this was tough. And if you're dealing, it with sounds like it. Yeah. Um, and I think I it's at the very beginning you talk about how you there was nothing before for this. Um, trying to basically you didn't have anything to build on it had been done previously you're really really starting from scratch yes to try and figure out what to do with these teens um, yeah people are probably tired of hearing me say it but I didn't inherit so much as a, a speck of glitter in a craft box there was, <laughs> mm -hmm. there was nothing going on other other than a, a solid book uh, collection we did have a great young adult mm -hmm. collection yeah. started well, I think a lot more libraries are doing this, these teen zones and things specific for them, um, and obviously it's it's working. If you do it right and um, mm -hmm. the consistency of how you're treating them um, and treating them respectfully makes all the difference in the world to people of that age, yeah. It can be tough, but it's it's really rewarding. So mm -hmm. I, I love my job, and I get to have a lot of fun, and now we have a great space to do it in, and staff overall is more positive. And, um, That's great, yeah, making sure wonderful. the other staff are um, involved in it as well. Like when they were talking about they're your kids, they're your kids, like, no, they're all our patrons. Yep. Yeah. That made a big difference. Have some some empowerment and ownership over, the, over them as well. <laughs> yes, yes. Don't make me always be the mean one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, spread it out a little, yeah. All right, great. I think we will then wrap it up. Yeah, I'm going to pull back uh, control here to my screen. Thank you uh, very much, Rochelle. That was great. Exactly what we were looking for here today, I think. Um, awesome. Thank great you. Great presentation. Um, I did, you know, I said it was from our conference last year, and I did miss it that time, so I'm glad I got to hear it this time, though. <laughs> yes, our power on our laptop died because it was the end of the day. It was the last session. Oh, really? I didn't so know. no one got to see all my great pictures. So oh. you're, you're seeing it at the right time. Well, I'm glad we got them <laughs> here then for you. <laughs> all right. Um, okay, that will wrap it up for today's show. Thank you, Rochelle. Thank uh, you. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, the show has been recorded and will be available on our website here. Let me back up there. This is our main page. All of our archives go right here on our archive sessions page, and we will have the recording available. This is last week's. The presentation available and the links you mentioned there at the end will all be available for you to watch later. Or if you have a colleague who wasn't able to join us this morning, share it with them. So, as I said, that wraps up for today. I hope you join us next week when our topic is, could a jigsaw puzzle tournament be your next fundraiser? Uh, North Platte, Nebraska, their public library has been doing these jigsaw puzzle tournaments for 10 years. And they have huge competitions, and it's a fundraising type thing, um, a real fun event. So I'm going to have their director, Cecilia, will be with us next week to talk about that um, program that they do. So um, please do sign up for that and any of our other future sessions that we have here. Uh, also. Encompass Live is on Facebook, so if you are a big Facebook user, please do pop over there and like our page. Uh, it's coming up slowly. Here we go. Um, I post when new shows are um, coming up, like here this morning. I gave people a reminder they could log in on the fly to today's show. When recordings are available, I announce on here. So if you are a big uh, um, Facebook user, uh, definitely go over that over there, and you'll be notified of things we're doing for the show. Other than that, thank you very much for attending, and we will see you uh, next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. <laughs>